Hello everyone and welcome to Fundamentals, a platform to understand your fund tenants. In this series, we bring to you the minds behind the funds you have invested in. Our guest for the day comes with a unique distinction. He has experience of managing funds across the investment spectrum from the PMS space to the mutual fund space. We are talking about none other than Mr. Chandri Prakash Padiyar. He has been associated with Tata Mutual Fund for the last four years and in his current capacity manages three main funds at Tata AMC. Today, we discuss the Tata Small Cap Fund, which is relatively a new entrant in the industry with about 2,400 crores of assets under management and vintage of around four years. The fund has been able to give a stellar 23.32% return since inception. Thank you, sir, for joining in. It's a pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you, Mega. Thank you so much for having me. Before I come to the particulars of the fund, let me first understand, uh, you know, what is your investment approach and style to uh, investing while you manage the Tata Small Cap Fund? So <clears throat> our philosophy of investing at Tata, Tata Mutual Fund is uh, growth at reasonable price. Uh, so let me actually articulate it is that the way we define growth at reasonable price for specifically for a Tata small cap fund in perspective is that I would ideally want to buy businesses which can, let's say in simple terms, uh, double earnings in two, three years time. So maybe around 25% plus compounded uh, profit growth over my investment horizon. Uh, along with profit growth, I would also want to have businesses which can generate free cash. Uh, this is a learning that we got post-2008 is that uh, growth is only profit growth is not important. You also need cash flows uh, because without cash, businesses don't survive. Uh, so along with high growth in profit, you also need free cash, which means that the balance sheets that we look at for companies that we invest in, uh, generally speaking, are very strong. They generate free cash or debt equity is either very low or there is zero debt equity. And lastly, a combination of growth, free cash should also come with reasonable valuation. And this is something that is where probably we differ maybe with uh, most other fund managers. So you would notice this uh, since you do this questioning very often with other fund managers that uh, growth at reasonable price as an investment philosophy is common in uh, as a philosophy uh, across or many mutual funds or asset managers. Uh, so the only way place or where you can differentiate is uh, through what so the, the details of the philosophy that one follows. And so growth everybody looks at, free cash flow nowadays everybody looks at after the learning that we all got from 2008, where there is a difference in opinion is on valuations. Uh, uh, there are shades of gray, let me put it this way, in terms of applying reasonable price as a framework to your stock selection. Uh, so for us, uh, and this is, uh, there is nothing right or wrong here, but this is something that we've, or I have learned uh, in managing money for investors is that if you're buying businesses, uh, you build a portfolio and let me start with how we build in small, small care fund and that will give you an example of what we do. Is that I have learned from experiences that when you are bottoms up in approach, when you use this growth at reasonable price and investment philosophy, uh, you are buying limited number of companies in your portfolio like Tata Small Care Fund, we buy around 40 companies across in our portfolio. Uh, what is important then is, so for example, I've learned one thing is that investors don't have too much patience uh, in giving time to the fund manager to deliver returns over a period of time. What I mean by that is that uh, everybody uh, were, would consider my performance, whether I'm good or bad, uh, comparing me compared to the benchmark index and my peer set uh, fund managers on a daily, weekly, monthly, three monthly, six monthly in one year and also long-term data. Now, if I have to do well consistently over short period and long period of time, I cannot afford, and this is a learning that I've had, is that you cannot have 100% of your portfolio uh, with growth at reasonable price in mind 
where everything is high growth and everything is also very cheap. Uh, because then what happens is that if valuations are cheap and if growth is high, uh, some sometimes there is a reason why market doesn't like it and valuations are cheap. Sometimes you have to wait. The patience required is high. So what we do in our portfolio, and this is where the uh, I'll come back to my original statement, is that in small cap, I would like to have a portfolio of somewhere around 70 to 30 or 80 to 20. What I mean by that is that 70 to 80 percent of the portfolio is, is built with the re-rating potential in mind. Where and what do I mean by re-rating potential? Uh, it's just that in my mind, when we do research, our research tells us that a particular company that we are buying is likely to grow and let's say likely to grow earnings at 100% in the next three years or double their earnings in three years' time. But the market, the consensus or people who are tracking that company would be assuming or we believe that at the time of buying that comp the market would be assuming lower, much lower growth, let's say 50, 60. So there is a surprise element from an earning delivery by that company over a period of time relative to what market expects. So that is what we believe. And, and when you get re-rate, when you get surprises by businesses over a period of time, consistently quarter after quarter, if managements deliver better than what people were expecting in the top line margins, uh, cash flows, uh, then logically what you see, so what market was expecting at the initial time, at, at, our, at our buying time, valuations, what you were seeing was not the right valuation. They were cheaper, much cheaper than what market believed. Uh, and because of the high earning delivery, and hence you get a re-rating of valuations. So that's 70 to 80 percent of the portfolio. The balance 20 to 30 percent of the portfolio is uh, built with uh, is uh, is uh, made up of stocks where uh, where valuation re-rating may not be significant, but there is a significant uh, or let's say earning growth is pretty decent. So this is the mix that we we tried, and this is different for different portfolios. So I've also managed, for example, the large and mid cap fund, where this ratio would be 50, 50, 50 60 percent and 40 percent in compounders, whereas in small cap it is 70, 80 percent re-rating end rates and 20, 30 percent in uh, compounders. So that's that's the way you build a portfolio. Uh, so this is what I mean by the investment philosophy. So we believe in growth at reasonable price. Uh, where strong growth in profits along with free cash available at a regional price, which means that there is surprises of earning delivery of company that we buy into and there is a re-rating potential in valuations in our investment horizon. Along with this investment philosophy, what is the direct correlation or direct kind of uh, features of this investment philosophy is that you we would have limited number of companies in the portfolio. So I would say, let's say in small cap fund, we have around 40 companies on an average. Uh, so number of companies are limited to 100% uh, bottoms up in a portfolio. So we don't look at benchmark indices so much in small cap fund. It's everything is company specific that you buy. Three, the average churn uh, in, the, in the portfolio that we build is quite low. Whatever business that we buy, we buy for the long term. So typically we buy for three years plus horizon. So these are some some of those uh, let's say direct uh, impact of the uh, growth at regional price using of the growth at regional price at investment philosophy. And I think you brought in a very important point that you know you will have to kind of own companies where the uh, re-rating potential is not what the market expects because anything anticipated is what the market doesn't react to. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, my next question, uh, while, while you did mention that you are more of a bottoms up uh, stock selection, selector, would you have some thresholds in mind? Uh, you know, uh, how, what are the trends that you would track to uh, estimate which sectors you would go ahead with? So, <clears throat> if we do, so let me put this, when we are a bottom up stock selector, uh, generally sectors don't come to our mind. Uh, but but there are so what does happen is that for example if you this is the fifth year of uh, me managing the small cap fund uh, and in the last five years uh, let's say when we when I started investing originally when we launched the fund in 2018 we created a portfolio uh, 
almost like 50 60% of the portfolio got churned last year or this year early this year uh, so what you see today is a new portfolio in, in many ways uh, which we are positioned now for the next 3 4 years but to answer come to your point uh, if you look at though we are stock specific and very bottom up interestingly what has come out is that uh, in the initial period between 2018 and 2021 the first 3 3 and a half years of the portfolio that we were running the original portfolio initially we were let's say close to 35 40% in chemicals uh, and uh, so very so significant skewness towards chemicals as a theme let's say uh, put it this way and increasingly so let uh, or let me rephrase initially since 2018 we've been more and more acquiring larger proportion of portfolio in manufacturing related companies we started a lot with chemicals only but this chemicals since 2021 have gone down to lower levels so we book profits out of that that those set of companies in a significant manner in late 2021 early 22 and instead what we've added is all manufacturing but into industrials engineering auto auto ancillary even logistics uh, we've we've kind of significantly increased our weightage towards logistics which is a direct or indirect correlations to manufacturing as a theme as well so i would say uh, we've worked on manufacturing as a theme in a very big way alongside to that we have also added logistics or some services oriented companies that we have liked uh, uh, so it's 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 more thematic approach that you tend to take and within that theme then you tend to have a larger skewness of a particular subsector uh, in the portfolio uh, but you know the the other thing that you would notice in, if you do the attribution of portfolios of the last four years uh, and even the current portfolio that you see you will realize that if you were to break it up between sectors then i would have more than 12 sectors uh, in the portfolio so there will be no specific sector other than chemicals in the initial time uh, so it has so happened that we have been able to identify companies across sectors uh, in the market. So uh, let me put it this way. In the initial phase, when we started building our portfolio in 2018, uh, the economy was not doing well. There were real estate challenges, the banking sector was not doing well. Uh, in fact, if you go back to that period, hardly only consumer companies were doing well and uh, IT sector was doing all these nearly okay. Pharma for some time had done well, but from a sectoral perspective, not many sectors were doing well. So there was skewness in the market. What you see today, and 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 which is why between 2018 and 19, the fund didn't do so well. Because in small cap, by nature, if you were to look at, let's say, I when we build the portfolio, we buy between we don't go below thousand crore market. So companies at thousand crore or higher than thousand crore is what we look at. And when you look at the mix of those 700, 750 companies which are there between 1,000 and 16,000 crore, uh, which is the small cap universe, uh, you will realize that a majority of those companies are manufacturing oriented. When your economy is not doing well, when your banking sector is not lending, struggling with NPS, and real estate also not doing well, uh, generally speaking, manufacturing is also weak. Between 18 and 19, though we were building a portfolio, returns were very weak. Uh, our enemies didn't move much actually. It's when the economy stabilized and uh, when this China plus one started and uh, even our Indian economy started doing well and the government focused a lot on Indianization and exports. And even now that focus even more. Uh, we are finding one broadening of the market is happening or has already happened. And across sectors, businesses have started doing well. And this is what you see. So initially, if you notice, which is what I was highlighting, initially my chemical part of the portfolio was as good as 40%. So a lot of skewness because one sector was doing well. We could identify within one sector, lot many companies doing well. So we built it. Uh, and IT companies were also at that time a part of the portfolio. Uh, today, when you look at the portfolio, you will observe that across sectors, we have more than 12 sectors where we've been able to identify companies. We are very diversified from a sectoral perspective. 
and we are able to identify companies growing or likely to grow earning at a fast pace. That's my, our view, our research. And uh, which uh, so earnings are likely to do well. And more importantly, valuations, in our opinion, are still very reasonable uh, with strong balances. So let me put it this way. In the small cap fund, 70% plus of the portfolio, last count that I did, uh, have zero debt in the balance sheet. So there is no leverage at all. And those companies are free cash. So that's that's what we see. So to come to your question again, uh, as of today, we find uh, manufacturing as a theme which is playing out very well. Indirectly, we've started playing some banks as well, which we were avoiding since 2018. So it was the first time in 2021, late 21, 22, early 22, we've started buying banks, and small size banks in the portfolio. Uh, and uh, and uh, lastly, it's quite well diversified. Right, I think you uh, highlighted a very important point that, you know, this rally, which we have seen in 2020 and 2021 has largely been broad based. And that is the reason probably we are seeing a three years uh, in a three year time frame, you know, small cap has actually outperformed both mid and la uh, large caps. Uh, this brings to me, uh, me to my third question, which is specific to the uh, statistics as far as this fund is concerned. Now, this fund has an premium of over 2,500 crores and uh, the vintage is approximately four years. Now, my question to you is, one, uh, whether size is an advantage or disadvantage. And second, you know, uh, for the investors who are deciding to participate in this fund, you know, since this fund has not really completed a cycle, how do they go about deciding the merit of this fund? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question, Mega. Actually, so size, I... At least I believe uh, size actually in small caps makes a lot of difference. Yes, to sustain performance. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you look at my fund, and you're right, uh, we are somewhere around 2,500 crore as of uh, in a year. And when we, when we started in 2018, we were 180 crore. Uh, so that size was uh, amazing actually to start with. Uh, and since then, we have grown in size, but it's still manageable. Let me put it this way. When we started the small cap fund at 180 crore, uh, my illiquidity liquidity part of the portfolio, uh, the way we define liquidity or illiquidity is that any company which I cannot sell within 10 days with 30% volume participation, that would be illiquid in the portfolio. In, since 2018, that illiquidity part of the portfolio has continued to go, go up. And as we stand today, it is somewhere around 55% plus. 55% plus of the portfolio has become illiquid because of the size of the EUM of, of the scheme. 55% uh, is, by the way, is still manageable, very much manageable, which is why I said that. Uh, so, so let's, let, let's, let's think about it this way, is that the risk in a small cap fund is that if I get a large redemption on one day or in one month, Will I be able to manage that redemption without affecting my NAV or there is no impact cost when I sell? That is generally the risk. When you talk about size in small cap fund, this is what matters. So at 2,500 crore, I'm saying my risk or illiquidity risk that I take is still manageable because it's somewhere around, let's say, six, let's assume 60% on the higher side. 40% is still liquid, which means, and we have never seen in our history of Tata Mutual Fund at least uh, uh, within any year. Uh, let alone one month where redemption exceeds even more than 10, 11% of the scheme. So, which tells you that at some point in time, uh, illiquid, Ill illiquidity starts hurting the composition or buildup of the portfolio. Right now it is 2,500 crore and at these levels, my levels are fairly comfortable from a management of, uh, or a risk of redemption perspective. Uh, but there comes a time, let's say my fund size grows to 5,000 crore. And if I have the same kind of stocks and the market is the same, my illiquidity level will go towards 80%, probably, theoretically. Uh, which means that buying similar companies, and, and the other thing that I want to highlight is that there are, at this time, in, out of that 40 companies, there are three companies where I'm close to 5% of equity capital of the company. Uh, which so these are numbers that one needs to keep in mind when you have three companies it's manageable there comes if i have this if i have to buy the same companies to perform consistently going forward 
And if my fund size doubles in size, I'll need to, I can't manage with three companies around 5%. I'll have to have maybe six, seven, eight companies where I own more than 5% of capital of the company. So illiquidity grows. Uh, so which is why if you would observe the larger size funds in small cap fund, uh, and there are uh, some of my peers who have more than 5,000 for AUM, uh, there are five, six of them. If you would observe, they would have around 25 to 35% of their portfolio in large caps and mid caps. And that's how they manage their Ill illiquidity risk. Since my fund size is reasonable uh, today, uh, I don't buy, uh, at the time of buying at least, I don't buy mid cap, large cap at all. I continue to buy small caps. Whatever small mid cap allocation that you see today is purely because they grew in market cap and their market cap started, they, those companies started getting classified in mid caps or large caps. I never bought them as mid cap or large cap. So, so these things happen uh, and uh, one needs to keep in mind uh, for our investors that if the larger the fund in a small cap category, the risk increases from an illiquidity perspective. Uh, as of now, we are okay. Uh, so the second part of the question in terms of uh, the, the kind of cyclicality or, or we have not seen all cycles yet in the fund. So what is the risk for investors? Uh, you're very right, actually. Uh, this is just four years of running this fund. Uh, and in this last four years, though we have seen correcting periods, uh, but they've not sustained for long. But the good thing that I want to highlight, and this, is, this comes out very clearly, every year in the last four years, Whenever markets have correct, our NAB has correct significantly lesser than the markets. So we have outperformed in a very big way during drawdowns when markets have corrected. And we have outperformed even bigger way when markets have done well. Uh, so at least in the last four years, the experience tells us so our stock selection has turned out to be good. Uh, the good, the, the uh, one of the heartening things that I can highlight is that We've not made mistakes actually. Uh, the key to making money or in small cap especially uh, is to not make mistakes. If I get something wrong, then the uh, impact cost can be pretty high. Uh, so fortunately in the last four years, we've not made mistakes. Uh, I will never say that I can't make mistakes in future, but at least last four years, we've been very conscious that we choose the company very well. We bet, we bet on the management team of the company that we invest in uh, and it's held us well till now. Right. So what I understand is you're a true to labor small cap fund. Uh, so my next question is, you know, uh, when investors are deciding on which funds they would like to invest in, they often get lured by returns. And in the small cap space, you know, especially in the last three periods, uh, three years under consideration, small caps can give a little misleading picture. So what are the risks associated with investing in a small cap fund? And what should be the ideal uh, time horizon that you would like an investor to come in with? So the biggest risk that I see is, and, and this happens with all thematic or all uh, sectoral funds or all uh, market cap oriented funds, specific funds like small cap, this happens everywhere, which is that at a, there comes a time when this category will become very expensive. And one needs to get out of this category when it becomes very expensive. So like 2017, uh, though my fund was not there in 2017, we started, we launched in late, late 2018. But 2017 was a crazy year. Uh, returns were very high for investors in small cap category. And valuations had gone to abnormally high levels across the board. And if somebody had not booked profits then, then because in 2018, NEV went, NEV for most small cap funds at that time, whoever was there, uh, went down by at least 50% or if not more. So you lost a lot of it of your value if you had not booked profit in 2017. Uh, and it took, it would have taken at least three years for that investor who invested in 2017 peak to just to come back to his original NEV. Now he's making money, but it's just that your patient's time horizon goes up significantly. So the, the risk in small cap as a category is that whenever it becomes very expensive, then one needs to reflect on it and book profit out of it. 
as of now, as I was saying, uh, valuations are reasonable, even though NAVs have moved up quite a bit, quite a lot, as you were highlighting between 2018 and now, uh, our returns have been pretty decent. Uh, but I would say even today, valuations are reasonable. So right now it is okay. Right now it is worth investing, worth remaining invested. Let me put it this way. Uh, but whenever valuations become expensive, one needs to think about uh, booking profit in this category. Uh, and that is the main risk. Uh, the other risk is illiquidity. Uh, as I was highlighting, uh, small caps are very illiquid. Uh, what it means is that whenever markets correct, generally speaking, whenever markets correct, let's say, uh, whenever index is correct by 10% plus, small caps tend to correct more. So, so the volatility of returns in small cap as a category is higher uh, than a large cap or a mid cap. And that is true even in the last four years. Uh, so since I managed the large and mid cap fund, just to highlight the standard deviation of returns in a large, large and mid cap fund for my fund in the last four years, have been something like 21-22% CAGR, uh, not giving exact figures, but around that range. Whereas the small cap fund uh, volatility of return is something like 24-25%. So it is 2 to 3 percentage point higher annualized CAGR standard deviation of return. So that's the other risk that, so risk rewards are higher, but the risk is also commensurately higher. Right. So just to, uh, you know, take your point a little further, what are the red flags one should look at uh, when you mentioned that the valuations look over uh, hyped? So I, when too many IPOs start happening, uh, uh, when, uh, I don't know, when when too much of money starts getting raised in, 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 in a category uh, and when there is overall bullish sentiment, uh, uh, that's generally a red flag, but let me give you a different perspective, not specifically on small cap. Uh, is 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 what I generally look at, uh, and it's 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 more a kind of telling you uh, what can be uh, what can give you a risk for investors in a very big way. Is that generally I have seen when, uh, <laughs> and it's an anecdotal. It's there is nothing hard rule there. But, uh, there is no scientific way to do it, but I have, whenever I have seen uh, my neighbors, my friends, uh, wherever I go, starts recommending stocks to me uh, rather than asking me. Uh, I have seen that's a that's a time where one needs to be very cautious. Uh, for, and it did start happening, uh, by the way, uh, in late 2021. Uh, second half of 2021, uh, everybody was very bullish on the markets. Uh, and we did start seeing everybody wanting to buy uh, stocks directly, direct stock. Uh, and since then, markets have not given any returns, by the way. Uh, last one year, we are negative or flat returns in the market. And small cap, though we have given well because of our stock selection, uh, but that enthusiasm or that momentum of people wanting to buy direct stock has certainly come down actually right now, so, which is which is one reason why I believe valuations look reasonable today and there are opportunities where we can make money. Right. I think it's a very valid point. And, you know, in that context, I definitely recommend reading Hobbit Marks to everybody. Uh, so my next question to you is, uh, you know, uh, you, you mentioned about the quality of the management of the companies you invest in. And, you know, as we all understand, it is very qualitative in nature. So how do you go about assessing the uh, companies from a governance standpoint? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's in, a, in many ways, it's more an art than a science, actually. So uh, very difficult to explain this to you on a call, but which is one reason why, uh, as and you would, since you track all funds very closely, you would, one, one of the parameters that you would look at is that what is the experience of the fund manager and what is the experience of the investment team within the whole investment uh, team. And because we've been, or let's say I or my team, uh, we've been meeting uh, the same promoter or the same management team, CEO, CFO, uh, or board of directors consistently for the last 22 years. Uh, in my 22 years, I've been meeting the same person, in, whether he's in the in company A or company B. I I know them, or they know me. I know them in terms of what they say in good times, bad times, 
uh, uh, so it's that is where I think experience plays a very large role. Uh, so it's important to then look from an historical. It's history learn teaches you a lot actually. So since we look at what that person has delivered in the last let's say ten years, fifteen years, twenty years, uh, you get a fair idea of how that person will deliver going forward. Uh, from a corporate governance perspective, what is the thought process generally that promoter or that CEO has in terms of sharing the wealth with uh, normal shareholders like us or retail shareholders? Uh, what is the ambition that the promoter has? Uh, how much of greed that it, it, a, per, a particular person has? So it, these are things that we need to uh, track on a regular basis. And uh, we build our own conviction on that. Uh, what is also important, one is corporate governance. This is what I mentioned. But the other is, which person can scale his business in a in what kind of an environment? So what capability does, does a CEO has or a promoter has or what kind of team do they have uh, that they will be able to deliver what we are saying? Uh, and that is also an important point that we need to track. And especially this applies a lot in small caps. Because if a Generally, I've seen mistakes happen on two counts. One is either we overpay for the earnings outlook that we see, or the company doesn't deliver at all in terms of what promises that they made and what we thought at the time of buying. Uh, so if so, these are the general things. Uh, one is valuation, and the other is earnings delivery doesn't happen. Uh, so if if we have if we bet on the right people. Who, who can deliver over a period of time. Uh, in fact, I will give you the statistics actually. 2021, so the current portfolio that we've built, by the way, uh, which we built in second half 2021 and early part 2022, the new portfolio, majority of it, uh, you would observe, and it's an interesting thing, 25 or around 24 or 25 companies out of 40 companies that we've bought have had a new CEO in the last two years. So actually, we have bet on the new guy uh, or new guy or uh, lady uh, to deliver. We believe that this person who has become the CEO is going to deliver. One of the big reasons why we bought that company actually is for that CEO, because we believe that CEO will deliver on what he's uh, better than the previous guy. Uh, and and hence the market is underappreciating the earning profile, and hence the re-rating will happen. Uh, so it's it's it, it there are uh, so it, it's important actually in many ways. Small cap, especially, I think it it applies everywhere. But small caps, it's very important to identify the right people behind the business. Right, I think the quality of management is paramount to investing in the small cap space, and that only comes with experience, as you rightly pointed out. So, my next question to you is: Tell us a few sectoral bets which went right for you, and which didn't go as you planned in the last four years. So, fortunately, uh, as I was saying, uh, we didn't have too many mistakes this time. Uh, one of the, uh, for example, uh, all that I booked, and that there too, I booked a profit or leave. I didn't book a loss, but we didn't make too much money in one company uh, was in one of the auto and auto ancillary come OEM, actually a small size uh, Pune based company uh, where uh, we didn't make uh, too much money. And one of, uh, we, yeah, actually we have not done well in one of the name, though the weightage was very small is the radio company. We, we still have a very small exposure in, in the entertainment with one of the radio company. Uh, and uh, unfortunately for for that company and for us, COVID uh, impacted the business environment from an ad perspective significantly and hence earnings didn't come out as planned. And uh, fortunately, we've taken a very small exposure uh, and hence the impact on the overall portfolio and the NAV was not very high. Other than that, uh, it's all successes. Uh, there are too many successes. Generally, I my experience in the last 22 years has been that out of a 30, 40 stock portfolio, you will have, let's say, two, three, four names doing well. In the last four years, uh, there are more than 20 names which have done well. Uh, so it's been a good uh, journey. Uh, almost everything that we bought or anybody would have bought in 2018 have done well. It's, 
be real and you asked mega you asked a very good question earlier is that what happens from now and and since the fund is young right now four years old uh, we have not yet seen the cycles of ups and downs the real journey is now going to be in the next three to so last one year for example markets have been flat the sec the, the immediate period also looks like to be a challenging phase so if we can manage this kind of environment with the right businesses uh then i would say that we we've, we've done a good job uh so for so let's say last 12 months also we have outperformed the benchmark index by almost like 11 12 percentage points so we are doing pretty well uh, even in a period where market is not doing well uh so hopefully you continue to do the do a good job uh, we still surprisingly uh, and this is why i'm saying it's surprising because my experience tells me that you cannot have so many good peaks at the same time uh but surprisingly it continues even now with the new portfolio so let's see i keeping my fingers crossed right i hope the pareto principle doesn't hold true in your uh, <laughs> your fine and you know best wishes for that for the benefit of our investors so uh, my last question before i conclude uh, this call is you know why we knew we know you as a fund manager you have a vintage of over 20 years and we have known you in your past role as well uh, you know what is the construct of the team the research analysts the risk processes uh, which ultimately are all responsible for the fund doing well as it is today yeah yeah very important because as you rightly say mega the it is never a one person job it is always a team effort and uh, i would 100% give credit to uh, me and my uh, so my team so uh, by the way in tata mutual fund we are 11 people in that investment team uh, out of which seven seven people are fund managers uh, like me uh, including rahul singh who is our cio uh, and four of them are dedicated research analysts for individual sectors uh, but i i would want to qualify this is by saying that all of our uh, all of us which is all 11 people whether i am a fund manager or a cio or an analyst the primary responsibility is uh, is to do research so uh, so designation doesn't matter in our business actually it matters from a so our responsibilities also get added from when i become a fund manager i get to choose what to buy build portfolios risk reward lies with me so that's that's the one part but my uh, majority of our time goes in research uh, so we are a fairly strong team of 11 people uh, the way our analyst team is uh, each of our analysts have an experience of more than 10 years in the market uh, each of them have been chosen Uh, in a manner that they bring domain expertise uh, with themselves in a, in such a way that we we uh, everybody brings their own expertise and when you combine everybody's expertise then we can cover the whole market or majority of the sectors in the market uh, so we are a full fledged research house in that sense we don't rely on outside research everything is internal to us which is very important when you are a bottom up stock picker when you are trying to choose businesses when you are trying to choose promoters more than the business or choose the management team behind the company uh, so we have a fairly strong team uh, and i would actually uh, i would certainly you, you can maybe sometime have a call like this for speaking to our individual analyst as well and you will love it actually they they are, each of us uh, each of our analyst team they have they are experienced quite experienced uh, have a deep knowledge in their respective sectors have been meeting their Uh, sectoral companies uh, or management teams daily day in and day out uh, regularly over the last 10 years plus uh, and that is how it helps us in avoiding taking extra risk or making mistakes right sir thank you so much for your time today and a very candid discussion explaining your investment framework how you go about uh, stock selection sectoral selection and uh, you know uh, i hope for the journey of the good uh, returns continues with the fund wishing you and your team all the best thank you so much thank you so much and thank you so much for your organization zwest as well uh, for having me uh, and we'll look forward to doing this uh, in future thank you so much